If you're new, you are jumping into sermon six of a seven-week series over Revelation chapter two and three called Seven Letters to Seven Churches. And here's the deal. John, the disciple of Jesus, was exiled on the island of Patmos, about 30 or 40 miles off the coast of modern-day Turkey. While he was there, living in a cave, he was praying and he had a vision. The word says that he was in the spirit and Jesus came to him in the vision and told him to write seven letters to seven different churches, the major churches in Asia Minor. These were churches of influence that had the potential to take the gospel to the whole world. And so he wrote unique letters to each church and delivered them. Uh, the way those would have been heard in the first end of the first century is that if we were, say, from the church of Philadelphia, which is the letter that we're going to study today, we would have gathered inside the room, uh, main room of one of our homes, piled all in there, and we would have been excited to hear this letter because of who it was from, the disciple John, whom they all knew because he brought the gospel to Asia Minor. Uh, this is the re- he and Philip and a few others are the reason they are a church at this time. And in the name of and by the very uh, uh, instruction of Jesus the King himself. So imagine gathering in a room, waiting to hear a person- personalized letter from Jesus. Would you like getting one of those today? Yeah. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to listen uh, to this. But I want to give you a little geographic orientation. We have to understand a little bit of the history in order to understand the letter. If you guys will show me the map. You remember that if you've been here all six weeks thus far, we started in Ephesus uh, down on the, the southern and western coast of Asia Minor. We moved up from there to Smyrna and up north again to Pergamum. Then we took that little dog leg over to Thyatira and last week we were in Sardis at the crossroads there. Those, those red roads are wide Roman roads. It opens up trade and economy all across Asia Minor and really all, all to the east. Today we come to the city of Philadelphia. It was called the gateway to the east because Philadelphia sat on the road that if you follow that red road south, you come to a harbor called Atalia. You see that on the coast down in the, the southern uh, most part of, of Asia Minor there? And that, from that harbor, uh, goods went out all over the east. So Philadelphia was called the gateway to the east. Now, we have a Philadelphia. Anybody ever been there in our country, right? Uh, good cheese steaks, right? Anybody ever eaten one of those? Come on. Yes, they're good. Uh, You would think, you know what the name means then. It means the city of what? Brotherly love. And you would think that that stemmed from some sort of nicety, right? However, it is named for this Philadelphia, and this Philadelphia is named for this reason. There is uh, two brothers, Eumenes II, who's ruling about 200 years before the birth of Christ in Philadelphia, and his brother, Attalus. Attalus wants to rule Philadelphia. And so he decides, as brothers often do, I'm going to kill my brother. I hope they don't often do that. You know, but I'm going to kill my brother because he wants what his brother has. His brother, Eumenes, who's in control at the time, finds out about it and gives his brother the nickname Philadelphus. It's sarcastic. It means your brotherly love. And so this is how the name is born. Now, names are important in the scripture. Name is identity, okay? Name is identity. You have to hold on to that as we move forward here. Now, if you zoom in just a little bit, I'll show you just uh, just a closer view of Philadelphia. It is right between Sardis and Colossae and is right on that road to Italia. In other words, they have trade, they have economy, and they, have, they are right smack dab in a valley that is full of vineyards, okay? So this is the wine country of this particular uh, region. They are known for everything grapes. 
wine, grape seed oil, you na- if you can produce it from a grape, they make money off of it in Philadelphia. Now, Philadelphia today, I went there, it's straight up to Philadelphia. Uh, we went there in the dark because we got there late and it's completely unexcavated, meaning there's nothing to take a picture of except a hill. All right, it's untouched. And so I don't have pictures to show you today, so you're gonna have to use your imagination a little bit uh, more. Now, it was founded to promote Hellenism. Now, this is the idea that Alexander the Great brought to Asia Minor that said, if I have gymnasium, that's education, if I have agora, that's shopping and entertainment. If I have a theater, that's entertainment. If I have these things, and if I have religion, gods and goddesses, I can change the world. And you realize through education, religion, and entertainment, you can change how people think. Does everybody see that happening these days? Alexander the Great was wise to that. And so he set up this in the gateway to the east so that Hellenism could go from Philadelphia out all all into the east, right? It was a smart move on Alexander the Great's part. It worked. Philadelphia is the gateway to the east. Uh, But Philadelphia has been through a lot of difficulty uh, in the period of time that we're talking about. So in 17 AD, there is an earthquake that causes so much damage in Philadelphia that it has to be rebuilt. And the emperor at the time, his name is Tiberius Caesar. Tiberius lends money or tribute to Philadelphia to rebuild the city for five years. And so in his honor, they rename Philadelphia Neo Caesarea, okay? So think about this. A city gets utterly destroyed and has to be rebuilt. You remember when I hit, hit Galveston? and how the whole thing was like shut down for a period of time. And then when it came back, it just came back a little different. It just came back a little slower. It just came back, it's it's great. I love going down there and all that, but it just came back a little bit different, right? In some ways, those kind of devastating things cause a new identity to be formed. In fact, with Galveston, a lot of people left and never came back, right? So they're going through with this destruction, a new identity sort of crisis, but they also get a new name. Whenever you name your, like, let's say we just renamed Houston something else, you know, Bryanville. (laughs) Today, we're all residents of Bryanville. That's 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 a signal of a massive identity change. Like, you owe somebody if you're gonna change it to fit his name and you're going through devastation. So they're going through a massive identity crisis in 17 AD. In the 70s AD, another disastrous earthquake comes. So they, about 50, 60 years, they they get everything put back together and they start living again. And then another earthquake, uh, the emperor comes in, he lends tribute, this is Vespasian. And so they go through devastating change and they rename it again to Flavia after Flavius, which is one of his uh, names. So again, identity change. Then in 92 AD, which is uh, after the reading of this letter, Domitian, who many view as a a horrific individual, says to uh, Philadelphia this, because he wants to be large and in charge, I'm going to burn half of all your vineyards, and you are not allowed to replant them. So imagine this. Imagine... We take half the economy from Houston today. Whatever you have to take out, whatever business sectors you have to take out in Houston, you take half the economy, and now we're living, same amount of people, on the half the amount of economy that we had yesterday. How does that change things? Drastically, drastically. It affects you in your living room, drastic. Right? So this is what's going on in Philadelphia under Domitian. They lose their major trade. And so they have gone through from 17 to 92, three name changes, three identity crises, and the city of brotherly love is, is so unstable. Man, who are they? They don't know the answers to the basic questions. You know, who are we? Where does our money come from? And what will our future be like? They have got no idea. They're very unstable. Now, the church... Is, is existing in the midst of all that. 
right? So the church has two problems. One, they live in the culture. And, and it's a good time to say this to all of us. Do you know that the people in the church, even though they love Jesus and worship the sovereign, true, and holy one, they experience the devastation of all of those earthquakes, the uncertainty of all of those name changes. They're part of the culture, okay? So they go through all of that as well, but not only are they going through all of that, they are being torn from the synagogue in this time, period of time in history, because they have determined that Jesus Christ is Lord, and they have placed their belief in him, and because of that, they are turned out of, in fact, excommunicated from the synagogue. Jesus will call it the synagogue of Satan, and they're, they're on their own, and they're small. This is no mega church. This is a tiny church in Philadelphia, struggling, struggling, struggling. Okay. Now, understanding that, we can read the letter. So would you stand with me and we will read Revelation chapter 3, 7 to 13. Here is what the scripture says. <clears throat> and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, the words of the Holy One, the true one, who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know what you, that you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. I am coming. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. The one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. Never shall he go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down from my God out of heaven and my own new name. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You can be seated. Now remember, this is apocalyptic literature, meaning it has meaning for the local church at Sardis, somewhere between 60 and 90 AD, but it also has a futuristic meaning for the church at large, and you're going to hear a lot of that today. Now, we begin with uh, the author's introduction of himself. He's telling the people, and I, I would love for you to pretend with me for a minute that you are in a home piled in, ears open, ready to hear from Jesus himself. And Jesus is introducing himself in this way. He says, uh, these are the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David. Now, he's saying this, I'm the Holy One. I'm the true one. This is a God claim. He's, uh, Isaiah chapter 40 verse 25 says, to, him, to whom then Will you compare me that I should be like him, Sat, says the Holy One. Now, the Holy One is a name that the prophet Isaiah and others use for God Almighty over and over again. Uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 24, a demon comes in, in contact with Jesus face to face, and the demon says, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So not only does the prophet Isaiah understand the, the differentiation or the uniqueness of being called the Holy One, the Sovereign One of God, but now you've got a demon saying of Jesus, you are the Holy One of God. Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, the martyrs are gathered around the throne of God, and they cry out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, 
how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Holy and true. So Jesus is saying to them, as he pens this letter through the hand of John, I'm the holy one, the true one. I'm not like any of the other gods in your town. I am him, the holy one, the true one. And he goes on to say this, who, uh, who has the key of David, who has the key of David. Now, what is that? Who has the key of David? Um, this is language borrowed from the prophets, particularly Isaiah. Jesus quotes Isaiah more than he quotes any other prophet. And again here, he's using his language. And what this key of David signifies is two things. One, complete control over the royal household the house and line of David that would become the kingdom of God, the throne that will endure forever. So he's saying, I have the key to that door, which tells us, secondly, that he is the only one that can allow entrance or completely exclude someone from the messianic kingdom of heaven. So when it says, I am the holy one, the true one, he's saying, I am God and I have the key of David that simply says, at the end of all things, I get to decide who comes in my kingdom and who does not. He's saying, I have complete and total authority for your eternity. So this is who we're talking about. Now, it's interesting that Jesus says in verse eight, I know your works, But unlike five of the seven letters, there is no condemnation for this little church that is struggling. None. Would you like to receive a letter from Jesus that had no condemnation for you, only affirmation? Whew. There's no no repent language in here, no no command to repent. It's very different than, than five of the seven. Okay, so there's no condemnation here, but what is given instantly, it says, behold, I know your works, behold, I have set before you an open door, which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power, and you have kept my word and not denied my name. So what is an open door that he's saying that he's given to them? Now, there are two school, schools of thought. One The open door is a missionary opportunity, like God has flung open the door for this church to take the gospel to all of Phrygia. Remember, this church is in an influential place. It's the gateway to the east. And so one thought is this door is opening and they need to take the gospel because they have now this open door. Paul uses similar language in Corinth to the letter of Corinth and 1 Corinth in 1 Corinthians 16, 8 and 9. He says this. But I'll stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective work has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. So many think, okay, this open door is the the time, it's the time and the place to take the gospel. And we know the gospel did expand to all of Phrygia. So maybe it was that one. A second school of thought, what is the open door, answering that question, is that this is an uh, eschatological door or a, a futuristic door. And it's as if Jesus is saying to them, though the door of the synagogue is closed to you now, you've been excommunicated because you believe on my name, the door to the messianic kingdom now and in the coming age is wide open to you and no one can shut it. This makes a lot of sense in context, okay? Jesus has the key, he can open the door, he's the one that can open it and no one can shut it, he's the one that can shut it and no one can open it. Now he's saying, I've given you an open door. I think it is futuristic. I think he is saying, uh, you've held fast and so you're you're gonna walk right through because I've opened the door for you. Now, here's what we do in our Western way of thinking, is we would choose one or the other, right? Like we'd think to ourselves, these can't both be right at the same time. But that's not how God works. There are times when it could be both. It could be that they have a, a gospel, an open door to take the gospel to Phrygia. And now is the time because he's, he's the sovereign one, the holy and true one. He's opened the door. 
and he's opened the door for them and no one else can shut it. And, and even though the synagogue has been closed to them, now they can enter the messianic kingdom right now and have eternal life forever and ever. And one day they will be in that kingdom, that new heaven, that new Jerusalem. So I think it is both personally, right? So, so this is the open door. He says he's given them an open door. And then he affirms them. He says, verse eight, that you have little power uh, go there with me. Imagine being this church in a crazy culture that worships multiple gods, that goes through waves of devastation, and you have no influence in the culture, no power in the culture, so to speak. You have little power, and yet, here he affirms them, two things. Yet, you have kept my word, and you have not denied my name. Now, what is that? We know this city is unstable. We know this church lives in a city that is unstable. But what we're finding here is that, that in the midst of all that instability, they have kept the word of God, the only thing that doesn't change. They kept it and they lived by it. Everything is changing all around them, all the time, even their name. But they kept the word of God, even the doors closed to them on the synagogue. They're persecuted. They kept the word. They kept it. There's no condemnation for that. There's only affirmation. You have an open door. Not only that, they held fast to the name of Jesus. Here's what they understood. Greater than being a citizen of Philadelphia is being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. So they held on to the king's name, Jesus. It's a good thing, too, because if you go to Philadelphia right now, you know what? It's just a hill. <laughs> Bunch of Syrian kids down at the bottom that are running from, from Syria now that are there, and there's nothing to show for it. It's a good thing they held on. They found their identity, not in the city, but in the name of Jesus. They held fast to that. When everything was changing, they held fast to the name of Jesus. He was their identity, greater than where they were from, what their zip code was, what they were a, a natural citizen of. They were citizens of the kingdom of heaven. So he affirms them, and then he gives them a threefold promise. Because you have kept my word and because you have held fast to my name, I'm going to do three things for you, beginning in verse 9. Number one, vindication is the promise. Look at, look at verse uh, 9. Behold, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say that they are Jews and are not, but lie. Behold, I will make them come and bow down before your feet, and they will learn that I have loved you. So Jesus is saying, a time is coming in the future when these that have persecuted you will bow before you because I am your Lord and they will learn of my love for you. That's vindication. Now, Jesus says this is the synagogue of Satan. They're not really Jews. They're not true Jews. They look like it on the outside. Paul faced this almost everywhere he went. Romans chapter 2, 28 and 29 he says, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision, which is the mark of the, the Hebrew covenant, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. So Jesus is saying of this synagogue in Philadelphia, hey, they're not true Jews their hearts haven't been circumcised. They have outward appearance, but they're persecuting me, they're persecuting you, and because of that, I will vindicate you before them. That's the first promise. Second is this. The second promise is found in verse 10. It says that he will keep them in or from the final season, season of testing. Look at verse 10. Because you have kept my word about patient endurance... I will keep you from the hour of trial that is coming to the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Now, that hour of trial that is coming to the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth, that is the great tribulation. It is talked about as a seven-year period of time where there will be suffering and trial prior to the pouring out of the wrath of God or the final judgment. 
right? So they're, he's using language pointing toward their, their eternal future. Now there's an issue here. In verse 10, it says, I will keep you in this sort of pro, this promise that he's making. I will keep you from, if you write in your Bible, put parentheses around from. I will keep you from the hour of trial. That word for from could be translated from, in, through, or of. Now, we would like it to be from. And so would the English Standard Version. Uh, we would like it to be from. But I'm telling you, the way that they've, they've interpreted this, per, this preposition, there's two things you need to know. They come to that with a filter about what they believe at the end, and they make a choice collectively. It's a really scientific process, but they make a choice. And secondarily, this passage, the whole thrust of it is based on patient endurance in suffering, this letter. Now, I'll be honest with you. I could stand here because there are theories. I could stand here and make a case for uh, the pre-tribulation rapture of the church from the Bible. That the church of Jesus Christ is raptured before the suffering uh, or the, per- the, the difficulty comes in, in the great tribulation. I can make a case for that. I can make an equal case for mid-trib or mid-tribulation in that the Bible has enough there to say uh, the tribulation comes in the middle of the rapture. I mean, the rapture comes in the middle of the tribulation, or I can make a case for post-trib or after the suffering, uh, the great period of suffering, the rapture comes, pre, mid, post. Here's what I will commit to. (laughs) I am a pre-wrath rapture of the church individual. In my thinking, God raptures the church before he pours out his final wrath. I think it's dangerous to assume pre-tribulation rapture. Why? Because if I assume pre-tribulation rapture, I don't prepare for tribulation. I don't equip people for tribulation. I don't equip my kids to go through tribulation for patient endurance, which is what this church is being affirmed for in this particular letter in times of tribulation. I don't equip for that. I just say, look, man, it's going to be like the movie. We're going to be flying on a plane and then we're gone. But what if it's not? I mean, it's clear, pre-wrath rapture of the church, but Jesus tells us we're going to have suffering. In fact, uh, When you begin to look at this, he uses this language in Mark and John and other places, but one verse out of Mark, for in those days there will be such tribulation as he is not, uh, as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. Why did his disciples and all the disciples after that need to know that if they're not going to endure that, be there? John 17, 15, he prays before he's crucified for believers, and he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. The thrust or the context of this letter is that they have been kept, they have been uh, patient and enduring through all of the difficulty. And I think this promise is saying, Jesus, the holy and true one, will keep them through this tribulation, and they will enter a door that cannot be shut. It's been open for them, and they'll go into the messianic kingdom, which I think has futuristic implications for the church. Now, was that a mouthful? Probably, if you haven't thought about it very much, but it's important. It's important because where it hits home is you will prepare your heart, your kids, your grandkids differently if you think they need to know how to go through suffering for the cause of Christ. All right, third promise. Verse 12, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. So he is saying to you who have kept uh, my word and kept held fast to my name, I will give you security and stability in the coming messianic age, right? It's coming, finally, it's coming. The way we know 
that is that it says, the one who conquers, I will make him a pillar in my temple. It's not that a human is going to magically become a pillar in the temple of God in the new Jerusalem, but instead it's an illusion to say you are going to have complete and total stability. You will not be uh, shaken in that regard. Now, he also says, Never shall he go out of it, and I will write on him the name of my God. So security, meaning you're going to dwell there forever. Never will you go out of it. And I will write on him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, and my own new name. Now, these are a people whose city has had its name changed three times. And now Jesus is saying to them, look, there is a better city, a new Jerusalem, Yerushalom, the city of peace. It's coming, and I'm going to write your name, this, the name of the city on you. You're going to be a citizen of that place, and it's got the name of my God on it, which means it conquers and is overall, and you can bank on it, and you get my own new name. You're mine. And to the people of Philadelphia, they're enduring for a time. Do you know all of those people that were sitting there in that room that day? Their bodies have died. But their soul went to heaven to be with Jesus. And when we get to that moment when the new Jerusalem comes, the old is gone and the new comes, like it talks about in, the, in Revelation, end of Revelation, when you get there, church, believers, the, the church of Philadelphia will be there. It's been open for them, but also for everyone who believes in the name of the Lord Jesus. So there is security and stability in the coming messianic age. And your identity is clear. I'm from the city of God, owned by God, because of the Son of God. That's it. Now, there is one command here. And the command is found in verse 11. In verse 11, it says, I am coming soon. And then here's the verb, hold fast what you have. Let me ask you a question. When life feels completely unstable, even maybe to the core of your identity, what do you hold fast Two. Okay, so there are two words here for the, for the, that connotate the idea of hold fast, two Greek words. One of them is this word kriteo. It means to grasp and to latch onto. When I was a kid, about six, seven years old, we went on a, a little adventure with my, uh, my grandfather, my grandmother, my parents were there, and we went to this park in North Alabama. In my mind, it was like Niagara Falls, but it was probably like a three-foot waterfall for all I know. You know how things are bigger when you're little and you go back and you're like, really? Well, uh, I thought I was falling off a cliff into this waterfall at this deal. So I grabbed onto a tree. I latched on. I curtailed that bad boy. And I would not let go. There was a point that my father had my ankles behind me and I'm like, uh-uh, I'm not letting go because I thought I was going over the, the end. When you're falling... What do you latch on to? That's the idea behind kriteo. The other word is hupomeno or hupomeni, which means the capacity uh, to hold up in the face of difficulty. So it's more like when difficulty comes, I can take it. I'll hold fast. That's not the word Jesus uses. He uses the word kriteo, and he uses kriteo on purpose because this small, powerless church has uh, been forced to and faithfully has curtailed two things, the word of God and the name of Jesus. The word of God and the name of Jesus. That's what they latched onto because they're part of the culture. The city's gone to pot three times. They don't even know who they are. Their economy is devastated. They have curtailed. Now, people latch on to a lot of different things. What do you latch on to 
when everything seems unstable. I'm gonna use two, two illustrations this morning. One I'm hesitant to use because it's raw and somehow I'll get, I'll get a lot of emails. Um, my email is josh.allen at... <laughs> um, the first illustration is this. Uh, our, our country seems unstable. Is that fair? I mean, if you've lived for any length of time, you feel different about right now than you've ever felt about days gone by. Um, there are a lot of like bullet points you could, you could make to say this is why, this is why, this is why, but it feels really unstable. Uh, the presidential election thing, I mean that, I'm looking at it. Truthfully, people ask me 200 times a day, what are we supposed to do? I don't know. I don't have your answer except to say, what do you curtail when everything seems unstable? Because the reality is, <clears throat> whatever happens to our nation, good, bad, and different, whatever happens, God is still sovereign. Jesus is on the throne. He's coming back again. He's opened a door, if you've confessed Christ, that cannot be shut to you. And you will have, then, in the coming messianic age, stability, security, and you will never leave. And you will have his name written on you, and you will be in the city of peace, the city of God, forever. However, you now are part of the goyim, the goyim. It is a word that means nations. When God put it on the heart, Jesus put it on the heart of the disciples to go and make disciples of all the goyim, that was you and many, many others, but you're part of that. However, th there was no covenant made to America the nation, does everybody understand that? There's no covenant to America in the Bible. There's a covenant to Israel in the Bible. And there's a covenant to all who would believe and confess the name of the Lord Jesus from every tribe and tongue in the Bible. But there is no covenant to America in the Bible. So if you curtail America, for instance, one day it just will blow away. Philadelphia, I guarantee you they never thought I'd be sitting up there 2,000 years later, 3,000 years later on a hill that once was the center of the universe for them. Okay. What do you curtail? I mean, maybe you look and you think, oh, man. I hear a lot of fear in believers right now because they haven't experienced this before in our nation. It seems like, what? And uh, they don't know what to do. I would say, don't fear. I'm not afraid. Don't be afraid. You know what command Jesus gives more than any? Fear not. Okay, so don't be afraid, but curtail. What do you curtail? The word of God in the name of Christ, no matter what the culture does. The word of God in the name of Christ. Okay. Second, maybe more or personal. Maybe that seems way out there for you, but does anybody's personal life seem unstable, right? Uh, ours has this week. And we, you go through, it's, not, it's, not, it's gonna sound like little things in comparison to earthquakes and all that, but it doesn't take much for me to feel unstable. Does it take much for, for you? So uh, coming back from a meeting Friday, my phone's lighting up, and I find out Angela's on the football field with one of our kids and an ambulance has been called and that's all the information I got. That's all we know. Go to the football field. So you know where you go in your mind, like from did she break her pinky to our lights out? You know, I don't know. And so for seven minutes or however long it took me to get there, you know what your, your parent heart is doing? <sighs> what is this? And we see a lot of bad stuff in our world, uh, not like our home, but we minister to a lot of people, and so we see worst case scenarios. So man, fear is getting in there, and she's okay. She had a concussion. She's okay. She's at home uh, today resting, but she's okay. Um, but it makes it on. You get to that unstable moment. Then I'm brushing my teeth this morning. It's like it's been a long weekend, man. 
Lord, have mercy. And um, I hear what sounds like a man in my attic. I live in a one-story house, so there's no, no upstairs. And I'm like, why is a man in my attic? It was, it was like 6 o'clock in the morning. And so my first thought is, and my second thought is, what am I getting ready to encounter here? And uh, so I go up there, and man, it is a raccoon the size of a black bear in my attic. <laughs> and I have to be at Deacon's meeting in like 35 minutes, you know, I'm thinking, oh, it's just unstable, right? It's still in my attic right now. It's in my attic, <laughs> eating duct work and probably... But I have a trap and peanut butter now, so we'll see. I'm going to shoot him in the head after I get him. <laughs> anyway, uh, I love animals, but not that one. And so, uh, but it's just unstable, right? It just causes instability. I mean, if you get hurt or injured, if you get a diagnosis or life gets unstable, it can turn on a dime. Am I right? What do you curtail? What do you latch on to in those moments because in that kind of stuff, it, it, the condition of your heart on the other side of all that determines, is determined by what you latched on to in the meantime to get through. And I believe Jesus is saying to the church at Philadelphia, I will see you through. And there's a door open. And those of you that have lived and lost there's a door open. I know you have wounds and pain. But if you will just latch onto the word of God and his name and take your identity in him more than your zip code, city of God, stability and security, eternal because of the Son of God, is coming for you. It's coming for you. What do you latch on to? We're given two things that are very clear, word of God and Jesus himself. I'm here to say everything else will let you down. Everything else will pass away, but my word will not pass away. I'm the holy one, the true one, the one who has the key of David. I have opened a door for you that no one can shut.